If you want that engineer's package, then uh, also you can uh, email any of these contacts. Uh, D Landy at PE Pipe for the engineer's package is probably the quickest one to do it, but here's uh, what everybody can, can do for you for that um, as well. And while we get up and running here, I'm going to launch a simple... Um, uh, I will find the poll. Um, please send us this uh, poll answer um, uh, for the couple of questions here for you. Uh, and then, um, Dustin, you ready to take over? Beautiful. Just to confirm, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we yes, see you. Absolutely. What are we doing here today? Wonderful. All right. So, uh, I hope that you'll uh, forgive me. I am a millennial through and through. I absolutely love memes. Um, I try and use them as much as I can. I think they're hilarious a lot a lot of the time and and can really convey uh, what you're going for um, a lot easier than having to talk through it all. So uh, you'll see some memes throughout my presentation. It does look like my video is giving us issues once again, though, or my camera. Oh, there we go. I think I'm back. So if I'm a little blurry, you're not here to see me, you're here to see the content. So I, I do apologize if my, my webcam goes a little screwy through this. Um, but I, I did say we're gonna talk a lot about history uh, today, and we're gonna talk about materials. Um, we're gonna talk about constructability and even into the nitty gritty, we're gonna talk about failure mechanisms of, of pipe materials, not just polymers, not just polyethylene PVC. We're gonna talk about you know kind of the history and where we see the future going uh, with pipe materials that are currently in the ground and, and what that's going to look like in the future. Uh, because that's we really need to know that. We, do, we don't only need to know how these pipes perform today, but how are they going to perform in the future? So uh, water pipes have been around for a very long time. Um, you know, 4,000 BC using open trenches, waterways, uh, and then getting into lead pipe, wood, stave, cast iron pipe has been around for a very long time. Uh, cast iron was actually a, a pretty good material. Um, it didn't really corrode uh, locally. It had corrosion across the entire surface of the pipe. So it, it actually corroded very um, uh, uniformly. And so it took a lot longer to have corrosion issues with the old cast iron materials. Uh, uh, clay and asbestos cement. Asbestos cement was more of a, um, a, a newer material because of the war efforts during World War II. Um, a lot of the metallics were going overseas and in and, 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 and the military effort. And so asbestos cement came out really heavily in the 40s and 50s and 60s as a water pipe material. Um, and it, it kind of fell out of favor for obvious reasons that we're all uh, very aware of today. Um, and then we moved into, you know, the ductile iron, which, you know, they claim they've been around for a long time, but ductile iron is, is considered a very new material. Uh, really, it's been around since the 1960s. Uh, so then you have concrete materials and then present day, you know, PVC, high density polyethylene, uh, even getting into other uh, new plastics like polyamides um, and, and now composite pipes. So uh, definitely a lot of new materials out there that we'll discuss today. So a good picture, you know, side by side yesterday versus today, uh, you know, looking at some of these older uh, concrete pipes on the left. And then this is a dual 42 inch uh, sewer force pain project that was actually done up in Salt Lake uh, City here in Utah. Uh, so a little bit of a before and after, if you will, to be able to see the, the real differences in, in constructability today uh, versus the old days. Uh, so a little bit more history now just on the plastic side. So uh, I, I personally take it as, an, as a personal attack whenever we go out to these trade shows and we're working the booth and people come up to us and they say, oh, hey, you're polyethylene. You're that new pipe material I've been hearing about. And while it, it's good to be the new kid on the block in some aspects, uh, it's also a dagger to my heart that, you know, these guys are thinking that we're we're new. You know, we've been around for a very long time. They just probably haven't seen us in the water and sewer market. Uh, we're not a predominant player. Uh, we're definitely getting bigger, especially on the trenchless side. We're the number one uh, trenchlessly installed material uh, for water and sewer systems. But we, we came out about the same time as PVC. And at that time, we both chased different markets. PVC chased after water and sewer because they had a bell and spigot pipe. Uh, polyethylene pipe has been fusible since day one. Uh, it's always been a weldable product. And so we chased 
the oil and gas market because we were chasing after welded steel pipe. That was the market that we would go after because we had a fusible product. And again, PVC had a bell and spigot product. And over the last 50, 60 years, both of our materials have come to completely uh, um, own those markets. You know, so if you look at natural gas distribution or even oil and gas gathering, um, HDPE pipe is the predominant player, you know, well into the 90% market share of oil and gas industry. Uh, PVC, on the other hand, chased the water and sewer market. And over the last 50 to 60 years, they now dominate that market. Uh, they're now well into the 60 to 70% range of all new water and sewer pipe going into the ground today. So again, both materials, we've been around about the same amount of time. We both got our um, American Waterworks Association standards within about a year of each other. Uh, so we've been around a long time together. We just chase different markets. But now polyethylene is getting more into the water and sewer side because we feel that we have a very good product to be able to help with a lot of the issues that we're seeing today uh, that are typical failure mechanisms in the water and sewer industry. And we're going to talk about that today. So more of a deep dive on just polyethylene now. Uh, polyethylene was first discovered uh, by two British chemists. Uh, they wound up using it to uh, insulate their radar wires in World War II. Um, in 1939, uh, Chevron Phillips was looking for a way to reduce engine pinging um, in, in their fuel additives, and they came up with a, a, a polyethylene and a way to mass produce it. Um, and then in 1953, uh, the invention of high-density polyethylene, which is more specific to what we're using today for pipe materials. And uh, the first you know, publicly available pipe, if you will, uh, was actually the hula hoop. So that was our the first pipe that was available out there. Hello. Oh, I'm great. How are you? I was say, Dan, if you don't mind muting your, uh, you already did though. We're good. All right. So uh, back to innovation though. So polyethylene, even though we have been around for 50 years, it is not the same material uh, 50 years ago. You know, it, it has had great increases in both tensile strength and slow crack growth resistance um, over the years. So this is a, a much better material today uh, that we're using. The most current material is PE4710. You can actually see that on the very bottom of this slide. Uh, considered a bimodal material, and it is the, the, the top of the top for high pressure ratings and everything today. Uh, some of the ways that we install pipe, as you showed earlier in it, changed significantly. Uh, and then this innovation really helps drive, especially in the trenchless market, we, we confuse that long run up in advance of installing longer uh, runs of productivity. So uh, the innovation within the HDPE market, especially in the past 10 years with new fittings and new appurtenances and things that we can get to is always uh, it excited me some just since we can install so much more so much quicker and, and subsequently reducing cost and social impacts and traffic impacts and other things like that so uh looks like we're having some uh latency things with your your camera are you ready to keep going or you want me to do it for you dusty nope I, i'm good um i'm i really wanted to get that camera working again so i gave it one last shot um one thing we could do is I could run the, the presentation for you and it'd be less upload if you want to try that. I do wonder if that would be the better uh, choice here. I wonder if that's what's given me my issue. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, if you don't mind, and you can pick up here. There we go. That's that's good, Alan. All, All right, right. Dust All right, Dusty. Yeah, it seems like we always have to have at least one technical issue. We go flawlessly every time. <laughs> All right, Dusty, you there? Yeah, I sure am. Okay. That was my last hurrah. All right, here we go. So next slide, please. All right, so with the polyethylene being a fusible product, um, it, it came to the point of, hey, how do we consistently fuse this pipe together? Um, and, and they reached out to a company called McElroy uh, to be able to figure that out. And with McElroy, we've been able to come up with great equipment, great machinery. Uh, you see some of the very early on fusion machines here in these pictures. Um, uh, and then moving on to the next slide to see 
uh, the final product, you know, some of the stuff that we're working with today, uh, which is the, you know, the iSeries tracked machine. And then you also have um, the data logger and electrofusion processors uh, on the left side of your screen. Uh, so the data logger actually can take uh, and mount onto these fusion machines and it can give you a full report of, uh, of that fusion and, and making sure that everything was done properly. Uh, it's a great tool. It also has GPS and a bunch of other really good features along with it. Uh, similar machines are used for fusible PVC. Uh, there has been some innovation in PVC, um, some that I'm very curious to see uh, kind of how they go. CPVC, obviously, for indoor plumbing has been around for quite a while now. Uh, one that we hear, you know, in the trade shows every once in a while uh, is uh, the PVCO, the oriented PVC. Uh, there's not a lot of information out there right now about it. I don't I don't, don't believe anybody's actually making that here in North America yet. Uh, I believe it's still coming out of Asia, but it's a it's a very interesting material that we're keeping an eye on. And then one of the more recent ones would be fusible PVC. And we'll talk a little bit about fusible PVC today as well. But really, let's talk about material properties. What is the difference between a polyethylene and a PVC? Well, first off, both are, are, are polymers, they're both plastic materials, uh, which means that they don't corrode. Uh, you're not gonna get tuberculation, you're not gonna get interior wall buildup, and you're not gonna get corrosion in the pipe. So that's a huge benefit to using HDPE and PVC is, uh, again, no corrosion issues. Uh, thermoplastic means that it can be uh, melted down several times and reformed or reshaped, made into either a new pipe or a fitting, or in this case that you just saw the video on, uh, this is the reason it, it's a butt fusible product. You know, this can be heat welded um, is because you can melt it down and it'll cool and take on the new shape uh, that you have uh, put it into. So this is uh, very, very, uh, 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 one of the best benefits of polyethylene is you can do this over and over again. We have a lot of companies that use HDPE pipe for dewatering or for temporary bypass where they'll fuse a, a, a length of pipe in line use it for months, years, however long they need, above ground, out in the sun. And when they're done, they'll cut it right back at the fusion and they'll put it on a truck and put it back in their storage yard. And that'll stay in the storage yard until they need to bring it back out and do another dewatering product, project. Uh, so there's a lot of companies out there that use it for that application. Uh, temperature ranges, HDPE pipe is a ductile pipe material, um, even at very cold temperatures. So even all the way down to negative 130 degrees, um, HDPE pipe is still a flexible material. It doesn't actually go into its glass transition state until, again, below negative 130. Uh, PVC, being an amorphous material, uh, actually acts in its glass state um, all the way up to about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's one big difference between polyethylene and PVC is its flexibility. Go next slide. And actually here's a great demonstration of flexibility. Um, this is a, a bucket drop test. We did this at McElroy several years ago now. Uh, I'd love to update this and, and do a drop on, on ductile iron as well. Um, but we're going to do a uh, uh, seven inch pipe length. All these are four inch diameter pipes. First, we did a cast iron. Those that aren't familiar with cast iron, fairly brittle, cracks very easily. Um, I always like to point out this is actually a DR14 PVC. Uh, so that's a substantially thick uh, piece of PVC. And then I also like to point out that we get uh, uh, that this polyethylene piece actually had a butt fusion in the middle of it. So not only was that a piece of pipe, uh, it was actually a, um, a, a fusion as well. So, uh, just we just got a question for point of clarity, Dusty. In your previous statement, you had said um, uh, for above ground use, you keep it out of the sunlight. Um, uh, that's just to make sure you're handling some thermal expansion to the pipe. But the 2% carbon black within the pipe included in the resin uh, extrusion process gives it ultimate uh, life UV radiation protection. So, yes, it's, it's perfectly fine above ground uh, for the duration of the use. Yeah, I'm sorry if I misspoke on that. Yeah, what I meant when I was saying we were doing dewatering or bypass, uh, the pipe can stay above ground for the entire life of the pipe. Um, it, can, it actually has the same uh, UV stability above or below ground. And actually, that's the next slides we're getting into. So HDPE pipe uses a carbon additive at 2% concentration. Uh, and this gives it, again, uh, outdoor exposure allowance. Uh, it's the only 
uh, pipe material out there. So black high density polyethylene uh, is the only pipe material out there that can be installed above ground. This makes it very, very commonly used oil and gas gathering where they leave it above ground. Uh, mining, very, very common for mining. Um, and then obviously the, the dewatering and bypass as well. Uh, so HDP pipe um, and PVC, you, you would think, well, why aren't other plastics using a carbon black additive? Um, and that's because it would actually create too much heat in other products. Um, a, a hot polyethylene pipe in the middle of the summer, let's say in West Texas, uh, can easily reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit in, in direct sunlight. Uh, if you were to use carbon black and other pipe materials, you could actually get you know permanent deformation of that pipe. Uh, from from too high of temperature. So that's why polyethylene can use it, but PVC and some of the others, you know, it's not really a possibility to use. Go ahead, next slide. And so PVC doesn't really have a, an outdoor um, uh, recommendation. They really don't say to keep it outdoor uh, very long. Um, I've seen some reports saying that one year outdoor storage is okay. Um, but everybody sees these kind of pipe yards, you know, in your local city. Uh, I live in a little town called Enoch, Utah. And here in Enoch, this is our local municipal pipe yard um, out behind the building. And, you know, I, I, I see this kind of stuff all over the country of just, you know, leftover PVC from projects and they keep it in the backyard, hopefully never to use it. Um, because when you do have this kind of UV degradation, you do start getting some pretty bad um, uh, impact resistance performance. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, this is pretty common, again, across the country, seeing this kind of stuff. So, then, Dusty, uh, with um, our pipe, the black pipe has, as long as the life of the pipe is, it's good outdoors in the presence of sunlight. But Houston, which does 120,000 lineal feet a month of polyethylene pipe, Dustin, they use gray pipe. How yeah. long does that gray HDPE last in the presence of sunlight? No, that's a great question, because I actually even have some pipe here behind me, this yellow stuff. Uh, very similar. It's still a polyethylene, but it's not a carbon black protected polyethylene. So any of the colored pipe, yellow, gray for sewer, um, and then all the polyethylene conduit colors, uh, they have a three-year uh, uh, UV stability. So you can have those outside stored for three years with no degradation of the pipe. So any kind of color, blue, yellow, gray, that's going to be three years. If it's black, it's a life of the pipe. It's indefinite. <clears throat> <clears throat> so HCP pipe, again, has been fusible since day one. Um, it's, it's inherently always been a fusible product. And because of that, we have all the ASTM standards to be able to fuse it and then to test those fusions. So the, the standard to fuse pipe to is ASTM F2620. Um, and then for testing it, there's lots of different options out there for how you test uh, these pipes. And so uh, the reason I bring that up, if you want to get into like a fusible PVC side, um, you know, that's a really, that's a proprietary process and there's not any ASTM standards out there uh, telling, you know, Joe contractor how to fuse that pipe. Let's go ahead. Next slide. So ease of construction, similarities, differences. The, the great thing between polyethylene and PVC is we actually have the exact same ASTM standards uh, for installation. So whether it's pressure pipe, whether it's sewer pipe, we actually use the exact same ASTM installation standards. Um, all of that information is now being uh, brought down through the American Water Works Association standards. Uh, so for polyethylene pipe, we have M55. You can go uh, next slide, please. Um, we have M55 for polyethylene, and then you have M23 for PVC. And both of those standards have those updated ASTM standards being brought down through them today. And so for flexible pipes, again, polyethylene, PVC, even ductile iron is considered a flexible pipe. And then you have rigid pipe burial design, which is going to be your concretes, your clay, and uh, AC pipe. Absolutely. So a while back, uh, Dusty, we did this presentation specifically to open cut, which we find uh, over 50% of the installs are open cut. And it was uh, certainly eye opening to think um, about uh, DIP, PVC and uh, HDPE being all flexible in the fact that they form a pipe and soil stiffness together to be able to distribute that load uh, to the soil from the top of the loading. So um, the viscoelastic behavior is unique to uh, HDPE. 
It gives us uh, characteristics of creep and stress relaxation. So creep is if we overstress that pipe for a definitive time period, we'll get some deformation. Uh, there's there's a yield limits. We'll discolor the pipe, like everybody can recognize that for a hula hoop. At some point in time, you've you've uh, discolored the hula hoop, and you know that you've gone beyond yield. Uh, the 4710 products and everything we use for municipal water, wastewater, definitely a different product. If someone out there wants to hula hoop with a, a 12 inch 4710, uh, let, let's take a look at it. Maybe that's King Kong style, but uh, stress relaxation is going to be simply after we've loaded the pipe so we could put it through its, its allowable bending radius and we just allow it to relax, then it becomes a happy pipe. And that behavior is very much unique to HTP. Pete? Alan, we just had a good question about, um, hey, does that bucket hurt the polyethylene? It kind of looks like that guy's banging it into that trench. Uh, what are the rules? And is that a safe trench, Alan? So um, I always like to show this video because it actually is in this trench. They have a bedding, which gives us the, the bottom of the trench characteristic that we need in order to be able to provide a soft spot for that pipe to go in. Um, they will be uh, compacting material on this, not in this video, but in a later one that we took by not having anyone in that excavation in that trench. Now we're making it safer uh, for the employees working on it and also more productive in that manner. Uh, but here you will... Uh, uh, simply um, um, backfill on top of that pipe, compact that backfill. Uh, it's not in an H20 loading area, so uh, native backfill is perfectly fine, uh, as well as in, in H20 loading areas as well. Um, just for, for comparison's sake, um, an H20 box truck loading. So the Penske with 10,000 pounds of gear at eight feet depth would exhibit less than one PSI on the exterior of the pipe, uh, in which case we're starting to diffuse those loads pretty incredibly through that. And we've got tables in that M55 that'll show you here some pretty safe limits here. Pete, go ahead and, uh, and opine. Yeah, so I, I do think, Alan, though, a, a best practice for that guy would be to use a, a synthetic sling to lay it in. Um, it'd be hard for him by himself to move that pipe and lay it in with a sling. But do you consider his what we just showed to be a best practice? Uh, I consider it to be a suitable practice for the application that they have uh, putting the pipe in in that manner as well. So uh, for everybody out there, the, the high-density polyethylene is rugged. It's durable. Um, that thermoplastic behavior where we can repeatedly heat and cool it, a 10% gouge allowance that if we get to 10% or less of that wall thickness, we can... Uh, it run the life of the pipe. Everything that we saw there would be perfectly acceptable to me to install it. Dusty, you ready to pick back up? Yeah. Um, one other thing I do like to point out on, on that bucket drop test is after inspecting the pipe, the pipe was actually fine. Um, if you did have any stress whitening, like Alan talked about earlier, um, from uh, the pipe being squeezed too far, um, that would definitely be reason to remove that section of pipe and, and replace it with a spool piece or, or some kind of a repair fitting. Uh, but HDP pipe is so flexible that we actually do allow what's called squeeze off of the product where you would take a squeeze tool and, and stop flow in the pipe by collapsing the pipe down onto itself. And so by dropping a buck off, bucket on it, that's a very quick impact, but it is an allowed impact as long as you're not damaging it with some kind of a sharp protrusion and, and really damaging that pipe wall past that 10% allowance, like Alan said. So it is allowed, uh, but just make sure you're inspecting your pipe if you did have something, a uh, piece of heavy equipment, for example, drive over the top of it or something like that. Um, more of an example on, on you know, laying sections of pipe, the longer lengths that you can be dealing with, uh, the more efficient you're going to be. Um, and and the, really the price of the, the installation comes down drastically when you start welding together, you know, these, you know, even possibly several thousand of feet of pipe um, into a pipe string and then installing them into a trench at once. Uh, this is back to that Salt Lake City project where they were putting in, uh, on average, about four to 500 foot pipe lengths at a time. 
Yep, that's that paradigm shift we like to talk about, Dusty, when when the contractor just rents more uh, ba uh, 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 shoring and trenching equipment and can recognize the value of installing 500,000 foot runs, uh, then they, they're simply not in front of the, the um, residents and customers anywhere near as long. We had a question about what drives the maximum cover depth in this table of a DR7 to DR21, minimum depth of cover for three foot, um, minimum depth of cover without H20 loading for two feet um there th this is a no calculations necessary table i'm sorry i didn't clarify that earlier if your design window is within these parameters uh you don't have to calculate anything with regard to the installation depths now HTP can be installed in much greater depths than these itself you just have to run through that calculation as we go through sorry thanks for That's... uh clarification out there in the question world we're getting a lot yeah, of questions a rolling in now. question thank you very much alan for that and there's definitely no high side limit on this um, and, you know, we put 25 feet in that table, uh, but HTP pipe is consistently buried in mines and buried in landfills uh, several hundred feet deep. Uh, and then you can actually say that the, the deeper you get, the less forces that are actually exerted on that pipe because the whole sol uh, soil column at that point is taking the load. Uh, but if you want to get into uh, deep burial, please reach out to us. We have great resources. Uh, the Plastic Pipe Institute has some great manuals on that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one big difference with polyethylene versus um, other materials is when it comes to trenchless, um, you know, you do need to think about, hey, if I have a thousand feet, 2000 feet, some of our trenchless installations have been 5000 feet, literally a mile of pipe, you have to be able to figure out where to stage it, you know, where am I going to be able to put this pipe material uh, to be able to get it to my my insertion pit. Um, here we have a great project on the right hand side. This was in Florida, uh, where they actually took a, a local park and were able to wrap this around uh, a, partially a parking lot, but really had a plenty of room because it is so flexible to be able to wrap around and come back on itself. The one on the left hand side was a dock in Hawaii, where they were fusing a pipe string together. This was the end of the dock and they couldn't go out into the waterway. So they actually wound up renting a crane and they just took the pipe straight up in the air as they welded it together. So lots of different options, um, but HDPE pipe is very, very flexible uh, for these kind of installations. Um, it, it also very, very easy to handle. Uh, both of these pipe materials, 20 inch on the left, 42 inch on the right, both of these are being handled with single machines. Uh, that's definitely not the case when it comes to other pipe materials. Uh, you need a lot more equipment to be able to handle them um, and to be able to make sure you're not putting too much stress on them because they are a, a, a stiffer product. You know, So you really need to be able to spread that load out and not have to worry about the pipe you know, uh, coming apart, especially at, at the fusions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with that, not only the flexibility, but that also comes in uh, and benefits us with smaller insertion pits. Uh, by far the smallest insertion pits of, of any pipe material, again, because it is the most flexible. Uh, here we have some great examples of pipe bursting, both pneumatic and static bursting, where we have very, very small, minimal excavations to be able to get the pipe uh, coming through and, and replacing that existing pipe material. Uh, King County, this is a great uh, case study. We won't, we don't have a lot of time. We're, we're a little behind here, so I won't go into great detail. But this was a, a fusible PVC job that was a, a pipe um, directional drill. Uh, wound up having a failure, and they had to come in and use HDPE pipe to then pipe burst through the fusible PVC pipe uh, to, to be able to save this, this water outfall. Uh, this was up uh, near the Seattle area. A uh, great project, but really just showed how, how durable the HDPE pipe was um, and, and coming to kind of save the day on this one. Uh, compressive fit liner. This one, we could do hours on just this alone, but it really is my favorite way to demonstrate the flexibility and the durability, even of the fusions, not just the pipe, with polyethylene. Uh, this is a compressed HDPE liner where we're going to do uh, a, a larger diameter pipe, we're going to reduce it through either a die or a, a roller box to a smaller diameter, insert it into the host pipe, and then we're going to relax it over time. It'll go back to its original size and become a tight fitting liner um, on the host pipe. Again, this is completely insane to watch in real person, in, in real life. Um, there's no need for annular grouting because it is a tight fitting liner. 
You can do these with thin wall if you just want it for corrosion protection, or you can do it for thick wall pipe if you want it to hold pressure and and uh, and soil loads. Uh, so it's it's very very versatile, great process, but it really shows the durability of the pipe to be able to go through that, including the fusions, going through that that reduction box and it not hurting the pipe at all. Uh, allowable leakage, this is actually the same table, whether it's PVC or, or ductile iron. Uh, this is during pressure testing. Uh, these are the allowable gallons uh, per diameter, per length of line that's allowed for uh, lost water for other pipe materials. Uh, next slide, polyethylene, actually, there's none. There's zero leakage allowed. Uh, that's not only during pressure testing, that's during the life of the pipe. Um, if you have leakage in a polyethylene pipe, that is a failed system. You know, we want a, a newly installed HDPE pipe system to be completely leak free. And that's the biggest benefit of using a butt fusion process is that you do have a completely um, uh, leak free system. So Dusty, if it's leak free, why do we have to have makeup water? Oh, good question. So at the very beginning of this uh, test standard, or, or uh, sorry, um, field procedure, which is ASTM F2164, the first hour that you pressurize the pipe, you're going to go through what's called an expansion phase. And this expansion phase is the pipe expanding and kind of settling into place from the pressure. And that takes about an hour. And so we're going to add a little bit of makeup water. We're going to maintain test pressure uh, for that very first hour. And then after that hour, we'll, we'll reduce the pressure slightly, maybe two to five PSI, and we'll start our timer. And from that point on, that pipe is, is done. It's not moving anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, it's, it's already expanded. Um, and, and we're talking, again, slight. We're talking thousands of an inch um, in diameter expansion. But over an, a large pipeline, that is enough. Uh, to, to reduce the pressure if not taken into account. So we have an expansion phase again for that first hour. And then after that hour, it goes to a uh, test phase. And after that, there's no makeup water. There's no pressure loss at all. Next slide, please. So now let's get into failure mechanisms. This is where I personally love getting into the history side, but also kind of looking to the future. What are we starting to see in municipalities today? What are we going to see in the future for failed piping? Because it's a huge, it's, it's a huge tax and a huge burden on our local municipalities um, to be able to have to fix all these pipelines. And so um, existing pipelines versus, you know, what in the future could we possibly be dealing with? Uh, so go ahead and the next one. So going back to the history side, cast iron has been around for a very, very long time. And you can notice here, there's not really a ton of corrosion issues. Um, this is more of a um, circular fracture, and that came from overloading the pipe. So if you had a cast iron pipe in the ground, uh, you came and you built a building on it or you put a road on it, it was overloaded, you would get a circumferential crack or fracture in the pipe. Uh, ductile iron solved for this issue. Um, when they, they created a ductile metallic material, they got rid of circular fracturing. You know, that, that really did go away predominantly as a, as a pipe failure method. But with that ductile iron, you've changed the chemistry, the molecular structure of that metallic pipe, and now you get uh, corrosion issues that weren't as predominant before in cast iron. You now have a lot worse corrosion issues with current ductile iron materials. And a lot of that also comes from a, a much thinner pipe wall in current uh, ductile iron versus the old cast iron that used to have a very, very thick pipe wall. Uh, asbestos cement, we we discussed this a little bit before. It really came out because of the war effort. We were sending a lot of the metallics to tanks and aircraft and things like that. And so asbestos cement became a, a very common material for water and sewer. Uh, but it brought back that same circular fracture, uh, a failure method that we had seen before um, with, with cast iron pipes. So this is a very, very common way for AC pipe to fail. Um, and now later into its life, uh, joint failures as well. Um, the reason I like to show this uh, table is because PVC has brought in kind of a new failure method. And it's a failure method that we're really not set up as a municipality to, uh, to be able to battle. And it's going to be a very expensive thing to go after. We're going to talk about that next. Go ahead, next slide. So we've all seen pictures like this. Um, I, I think I even started out the presentation with a picture construction issues, installation issues, over insertion, tapping issues, um, or over deflection. 
can can create these long running cracks, these bell splits. Uh, next slide. And these are so common. There's actually uh, tools out there. There's fittings out there that uh, you can use to prevent it. To you know, to make sure that you're not going to get over insertion. Because just because you didn't over insert this joint doesn't mean that as you install the next one, you're not going to over install the next joint down. Uh, if you don't have the pipe compacted and backfilled, and you, uh, the pipe's not going in straight enough, and it's too much resistance, it can absolutely over insert a downline fitting if some kind of a, a, a preventer or a fitting preventer isn't used. Uh, so this is something that's very, very important with PVC to make sure that we're not over inserting or over deflecting a bell. Uh, rolled gaskets. Uh, this is again, this is not. <laughs> That was rough. <laughs> this is a rolled gasket on a PVC system, uh, but any bell and spigot joint uh, product uh, is susceptible to this. Um, you know, if you get a, a improperly installed gasket um, or joint, uh, you can get you know these severe leakages. Um, and this was a camera inspection of the pipeline after it was installed. My apologies to everyone out there. That was a whole lot louder than I thought it would have been. <laughs> That's okay, Alan. We we, we forgive you. Uh, next slide, please, though. Um, and so this actually gets into a, a really big part of, you know, proper installation methods for PVC and ductile iron uh, to make sure that, you know, we're installing it straight. We're installing it, you know, with the, with the proper lube, the proper lubrication uh, to make sure we're not going to damage these joints or, or have potential damage in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So the way that polyethylene has been able to get away from any of those styles or types of failures is by using butt fusion. You know, uh, this is really, a, it's a foolproof way of being able to install HDPE pipe and have a leak-free joint with no gaskets. So with that fusion, there's three parts of this that we really like to drive home. There's going to be first your training. You know, we want to have a trained fusion operator. There are all the standards out there that exist today. You can go in. Anybody can read those standards. Anybody can be trained on this process. Whenever you buy the pipe from a distributor, they most distributors offer training. Um, and then you have the process. What is the actual procedure we're using to join that pipe? What's the equipment we're using to join that pipe? And then you have final verification. This is going to be testing. This is going to be data logging. And this is kind of our, our fusion pyramid, if you will, to make sure that we're guaranteeing a properly done fusion in the field. Okay, and Dusty. I wanted to take a segue here because we've had some great questions on uh, uh, failure of HDPE. Um, and then this kind of se sets us up for addressing some of the most common failures, which is poor training conditions. Um, electrofusion takes a little bit more work uh, to try to prep the pipe from the uh, actual um, uh, operator standpoint than a butt fusion machine, which will handle a lot of it. Uh, we want to make sure we get back down to virgin resin material. So we're looking for pure HDPE with no contaminants in there to give that good fusion. Uh, a lot of the uh, the McElroy equipment we talked about is is uh, set up to do that fairly easily, and so is the processy as it's been developing for uh, electrofusion. Uh, some of the earlier failures of HTPE from what we've seen uh, in the Southwest when we had higher temperatures uh, and then also higher chlorine concentrations than what was permissible by EPA limits for distribution system led to pinhole leaks in service line connections. Uh, so a lot of the development of what the industry has done is to move to a much thicker service line uh, wall. So you can only get services in DR9 at that time. Uh, now and then also started to move to what's called a CC3 chlorine rating, which is a higher chlorine resistance. We've also had questions about clarity between chlorine gas, chlorine dioxide as a gas, uh, and then um, liquid bleach or chlorine free chlorine for use within dis disinfection in the system. And I want to clarify there's two types of disinfection 
primary disinfection, which is what's primarily consumed at the water treatment plant to get rid of all the nasties that may very well otherwise be in the water when we get there. And then secondary disinfection, which goes out into the system. Uh, <clears throat> so chlorine gas, uh, as it's created, or chlorine dioxide, uh, is something that is created at water treatment plant. Uh, it's a high oxidizer. In some places, it could be lethal in that manner. Uh, and then also that is consumed rapidly at the primary disinfection. It is not recommended to use chlorine dioxide with high-density polyethylene as a secondary disinfection because of the strength of the oxidizer. Now, a disinfectant is meant to simply release uh, electrons, and it's going to do that uh, regardless. Uh, so that the whole purpose of an oxidizer is to do just that. And the industry has innovated through its development of resin to be able to try to address some of those things. And here's a good example of the machine doing the heavy lifting for you, Dusty, and then I'll turn it right back over to you, all right? Absolutely. Yeah, so this is actually called our poly, the poly horse, and it's going to be a table that you load pipe onto that can then load into the fusion machine and uh, eliminates a lot of heavy equipment moving around and, and moving pipes uh, back and forth. Peter. Yeah, I'd like to add a little color to that. If you go back one slide to that triangle, you know, Dusty, a lot of people in the PVC side of the world give us a hard time for the fact that we have to have training and that this whole, the way we put our pipe together versus the way they put their pipe together is so much more complicated. You know, we have to have a fusion machine, whereas they they just have, the, they teach the guy how to put the bell and spigot together in the trench. That That is totally true. But what we end up with, Dusty, on the polyethylene side is a joint that's actually stronger than the pipe itself. Um, they, they say it's as strong, if not stronger, but Dusty, it's stronger than the pipe itself. And we end up with a well over a hundred year joint. And as we all know, one of the most common failure mechanisms of legacy systems, Dusty, is failure at the joint for whatever reason. Yep, exactly. And we'll talk about that. And you, uh, Alan took some of my thunder away, skipping ahead to failure mechanisms, because we will talk about failure polyethylene as well, uh, not just PVC and metallic materials. Uh, but uh, Alan did hit it right on the head. Uh, predominantly, the failure method for polyethylene has been pinhole leaks. Um, and some of those can be from chlorine attack, uh, but also just in general, slow crack growth um, in the pipes. And so that was our, our failure mechanism for a long, long time. And that is evaluated in testing uh, using what's called the PENT test. It's a Pennsylvania notch test. And PENT testing to classify as a 4710 material is 500 hours of slow crack growth, growth resistance. Um, all materials today are pretty much 10,000 hours plus of PENT. So, you know, a, a 20 times multiplier um, in, in slow crack growth resistance of modern PE 4710 materials. So really slow crack growth, um, you know, as we used to know it to cause pinhole leaks uh, and, and be the failure mechanism of HDPE pipe is going to be, you know, possibly even much further past a hundred years. Um, so it, it's very uh, interesting to see. And we'll talk about that even a little bit more, but I did want to say, you know, we're not going to just skip over HDPE pipe and, and what that failure is going to look like in the future as well. Uh, we'll definitely talk about it. So uh, here's the guidance from the PVC industry uh, for you know what the allowable deflection inside of a bell and spigot joint is. Uh, for most sizes you're using in a water system 12 inches and down, you have a two degree of bell angle. And then the larger diameters, you're only allowed one. Uh, one thing I do like to point out here, at, at just two degrees, if you were to exceed that and go to three, three degrees, you can actually start ex uh, uh, getting bell failures. So it's a very tight window to be able to walk that if you do want to, to gently bend this pipe in a curvature, you can go to the next slide, um, you, you don't want to overbend it because that overbending can result in, in failure. Uh, next slide again. This is just showing uh, fusible PVC versus bell and spigot and then also ductile iron bell and spigot. Um, so HDPE pipe, PVC is about 100 times greater. Uh, and same with ductile iron. In the larger diameters, ductile iron and PVC actually have the same bend radius. You can go ahead forward again. <laughs> you can have uh, about 100 times greater bend radius. Uh, and then the, the fusible PVC, because there's not a bell and spigot joint, uh, it's even greater than bell, bell and spigot jointed PVC to be able to bend a fusible PVC. 
um, HTTP pipe, their, kind of their claim to fame, if you will, is you can take a standard eight inch diameter water pipe. You can ra wrap it around a, a standard 40 foot cul-de-sac with zero fittings. Um, that, that's how flexible this pipe material is. Next slide. So let's talk about, we talked a little bit about chlorine. Let's talk about hydrocarbon permeation. This is a question that we get a lot uh, because HCP pipe is a permeable pipe material. Um, and so we get the question a lot, hey, we don't want to use this in our water system. You know, what if, you know, what if we did have a, an example or an instance of hydrocarbon permeation? And so we did a pretty deep dive on this. The Water Research Foundation actually did a study on it as well, um, where they went out into the field and collected all their data points on pipe materials and what was getting permeated and what wasn't. And actually, all the, the reports showed per, uh, permeation through gasketed joints of PVC and ductile iron. So they didn't come across anything with polyethylene that was a pipe permeation. They only came across bell and spigot jointed permeation issues. And so uh, we still uh, worked with the University of Purdue to figure out, hey, if you have a, a brown cloud, if you have an area that you're going through that is known contaminated soil, what's kind of the best practices uh, to be able to use polyethylene pipe in a permeated soil? And obviously the best answer to that is to just remove the soil if possible and bring in clean import. That's the best way to do it right off the bat. If you have a directional drill, for example, uh, and you're going through that area, you're going to be using what's called a dual containment pipe. That's actually an HDPE pipe inside of another HDPE pipe. And that's going to make sure that if you do get any uh, contamination, any permeation, it'll uh, soak into the outside layer of polyethylene, leaving that inside pipe completely car uh, hydrocarbon free. And Out Dustin, those those are very commonly used in really nasty situations in landfill where we're collecting leachate uh, from the mush of the landfill as it, as it uh, degrades within that area, right? So we're using it in one of the hardest environments. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're not going to be able to afford the opportunity to uh, environmentally clean up the, the brownfield, then dual containment is a great way to go. Yeah, right? absolutely. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that, Alan. I just want to mention we're at an hour. We have 15 minutes left and we're on time. So you're doing a great job, Dusty. Uh, and Alan, uh, for those people that are leaving early, could you please reconfirm what the procedure is for people that want PDHs or CEUs? Okay. If you wanted a PDH as part of this, there's a survey at the end uh, as to which you would uh, click on that answer to that survey and give us what license and what state you need. And that's the easiest way for us to be able to set that through. Uh, and then we'll keep going. Um, and right now I'll, I'll load up another poll question for everybody. Thank you so much for your attention. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Alan. Go ahead. Next slide as well. Uh, so this isn't the only issue you have to worry about uh, as far as the hydrocarbon permeation uh, when it comes to gasketed materials. And this is common knowledge. Anybody that's using chloramines in their in their water system knows that they need to get gaskets specifically made to resist chloramines. Uh, luckily for polyethylene pipe, chloramine doesn't really hurt us at all. Um, it's by far our preferred disinfectant. Uh, we love chloramine. Uh, next one is obviously chlorine. We have well over 100 year life. Uh, using free chlorines, uh, whether gas or tablet form, using polyethylene. And then as uh, as Alan mentioned before, chlorine dioxide, we definitely like to stay away from, unless it's a system that you know you're going to be replacing, you know, in less than 50 years. Uh, but, you know, chlorine dioxide, again, can be very, very uh, aggressive uh, to all pipe materials. Uh, this is one great study that we love to reference. Uh, this is actually done by the EPA. That earlier video that we saw uh, with the rolled gasket, you see something like that and you think, well, you know, that's too bad because you're losing a lot of water. And so you have exfiltration, you know, you have leakage. Uh, what the EPA was wanting to look at here is if we have a rolled gasket or a leaking joint of any kind, what's the possibility of actually getting now contaminated groundwater that's around the pipe into the pipe? And they found that with every pressure surge you have, you have a, a, a the low side of that surge, which can actually bring contaminated groundwater that surrounds the pipe through that same leak into the fluid stream. And so this is a, something that's very well understood now. This is we know how to design for to against this, but it's one of the big issues with a, a, a leaking bell and spigot joint is you know getting these potential. Um, you know, coliforms and bacteria into your pipeline. 
So the city of Calgary was having a lot of failures. This is a little bit older of information now, well over 10 years, but they really wanted to understand um, you know, what, what the reason why they were having so many issues. And they were having failures in both ductile iron and in PVC. And so they, they launched a huge study. This is one of the best studies I've seen across the uh, North America on failure mechanisms and, and really what was going on. And they found that they were having a lot of catastrophic PVC failures. And all of them really came down to installation. Uh, they were being tapped incorrectly. They were being over-inserted, over-deflected. And they all came back to installation, to construction. Uh, but they were having these failures within you know, less than 10 years. And if they got past that 10 to 15 year mark, they, they were pretty confident that they were going to have a good PVC system that was going to last for quite a while. But if they, that first 10 to 15 years, if it was installed incorrectly, they'd start having these catastrophic failures. Uh, go ahead, next, uh, next slide, please. And so what they found was that the ductile iron was breaking much more frequently, and these were corrosion failures. So they were having 16 breaks per 100 miles in, in iron pipes, where PVC was only having 1.2 breaks per 100 miles. But the, the craziest part of this study, uh, in my mind, was the cost to repair these failures. So even though we're having you know 15 times the break rate in iron pipes, the failures in iron were much cheaper to repair, where the, the failures in PVC were catastrophic. They were, they were taking out large uh, intersections, they were taking out large uh, sections of roadway uh, because they were these long running split cracks. And it, so we're, even though we were at seven and a half percent the break rate, it was 764% of the break cost. Uh, just a, a huge number. Average PVC break uh, cost $107,000. Uh, to to fix. I would also like to mention now, uh, this is pre-COVID inflation. <laughs> so these costs, I'm sure, have gone up dramatically. Uh, PVC pipe is a brittle material, um, and we've talked about this being in its last transition state. Uh, so in the M23 in installation manual, there is a warning. You know, if this is tapped inappropriately, uh, then, you know, there is a possibility of sidewall blowout, of, of injuries coming from that. So if you want to go ahead and play this video for uh, of Dante. Yep, absolutely. So show this. for clarification, <laughs> both HDPE and PVC cannot be direct tapped. They have to be direct uh, or tapped through a fitting. It just happened to be way back at the beginning when we talked about the brittle or the ductile nature and temperature range of the pipe that makes it different in that manner. Yep. And by all means, uh, Dante is doing nothing right here. He is using a tapping saddle. So there's that. That's pretty good. Uh, but we can, I'm sure, point out at least half a dozen I things that uh, no. it's not going right in this tapping exercise. Oh, that's cool. Huh? Oh, sorry. We try as hard as we can to show perfect videos, but th yeah, that's not always the case. Damn. So Dante was not hurt through this process, if I remember correctly. Is that, that is correct. Dante is just fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that's not a, a failure mechanism that you're going to have to worry about when it comes to the tapping polyethylene pipe. Uh, you will be using a tapping saddle um, or an electrofusion saddle, uh, but you're definitely not going to have to ever worry about sidewall blowout. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Let's talk about industry standards now. So I love this, this graph. I love this slide in general. I like to talk about how, you know, plastics as a piping material in pressure applications would not be possible without a great understanding of this graph. Um, if you were to take a plastic material, again, any plastic, and design it like you were designing a metallic, you would have um, early failures. You know, if you just took it, hey, the potential strength is X, we're going to divide that by two, and we're just going to throw it in pressure. Um, you know, you're not understanding that plastics uh, pressure resistance is based off of time. It is time dependent. And so this graph is going to give us our stress uh, resistance over time. And it doesn't matter, again, if this is polyethylene, if this is PVC, if this is polyamides, nylon pipe, all plastic pipe materials have to go through this process and we need to know backwards and forwards how that pipe is going to react over time to the pressures it's going to be under. 
And so this is a great graph. This is actually data that's housed within the Plastic Pipe Institute uh, through their TR4 listings. If you have a pressure pipe that you want to sell into public, you have to have this data. Both the resin manufacturers and the pipe manufacturers, we need to know this information before we are allowed to sell you pressure pipe for your water system. So this is a great graph. You ever want to go on a deep, deep dive on this? Uh, PPI actually teaches classes on the process, um, or you can reach out to your local pipe rack and they can go through it with you. HDPE pipe is not like other pipe materials when it comes to surge. Uh, because we are a very flexible material, we have a, a low flexural modulus, uh, we can take much greater surges uh, than the other pipe materials, whether it's ductile iron or PVC. Uh, so HDPE pipe, you're allowed a two times surge for uh, occasional surge. So a DR11 rated at 100 or 200 PSI would be allowed to surge up to 400 PSI. Um, on top of that allowed surge, it takes a much higher flow velocity to be able to get to a, that high surge. So back to that DR11 example, if you wanna hit that 200 PSI allowed surge up to 400 max, it takes 14 feet per second to get to that high surge. Uh, so it, it's much more flexible of a material. The pipe ultimately acts as a giant shock absorber. So instead of you sending uh, that, that water hammer down through the water column and having it affect you know, pipe and fittings and valves upstream, uh, the, the HDPE pipe is going to absorb that energy over the length. And, and so those surges aren't as great. Uh, another great example of PVC versus ductile iron here. Uh, on on what the surges are, but now let's not only talk about amplitude. Let's talk about you know occurrence. You know how often can you have surges in a water system? And in, in, in a typical distribution system, you're having you know hundreds of surges every day. Uh, so uh, valves turning on and off, pumps turning on and off. You have a lot of cyclical uh, of, uh, highs and lows throughout the day. And so HDP pipe. We have tons of studies now going well into the millions of cycles uh, with no fatigue failures or damage. Uh, this is actually such a high performing material. The fatigue is not really a design consideration for polyethylene. You don't really need to go into the, the nitty gritty and the deep dark on figuring out how this pipe is gonna handle surge and fatigue because you're not gonna get to a point where it's gonna be a failure issue. Alan. So uh, just for clarification, we've had a couple of questions roll in. Um, uh, as you get to the end of this, there'll be a survey for PDHs. Make sure you check that box. Tell us what state you want it in or what certification you want it in. If you wanted a PDH or a PDF copy of the slides, we can't oblige. Got to uh, indicate where you want us to send that to. Uh, just like all webinars through the Alliance for PE Pipe, these will go up on our YouTube channel as well. So you can make sure to share with your colleagues as we go through through. Um, Dusty, one of the clarifications I'd like to make through um, these past couple of slides uh, is the way that the surge um, and the pressure class are designed or, or uh, handled within industry standards is different across all three pipe materials. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. Okay, so you'd have to understand a little more about that pipe to be able to make sure you're accounting for that surge uh, properly, but it sounds like HTP is one of the most forgiving because of its viscoelastic behavior is what I'm, I'm catching from that. Is that about right? Yep, that is correct. So ductile iron being the stiffest material, having the highest flexural modulus, uh, at just two feet per second, you would get a 100 PSI surge. Uh, from just two feet per second water flow. Uh, PVC, it's only like 47 PSI. For polyethylene, it's like 14 PSI. So at those same velocities, the, the more flexible the material is, the lower the pressure spike will be. Uh, PVC, we understand PVC failure and fatigue very, very well. Uh, this is absolutely a design consideration for PVC. This will ultimately be the failure mechanism for all PVC. So let's say we get past that 14, 15 year mark, it was installed correctly. We're not gonna have those early on failures from over insertion, over deflection or tapping issues. Uh, the ultimate failure mechanism for PVC will be fatigue cracking. Um, and again, this is where we aren't really uh, uh, ramped up at, at municipalities to be able to fix these styles of failures. You know, we're used to corrosion failures. We're used to circular failures. You go put a band clamp on it, you're back up and running. Where a fatigue failure, a long axial running crack is going to take out a section of pipe that requires a lot more uh, replacement, a lot more uh, maintenance costs. 
Uh, next slide. HDP pipe. Uh, one of my favorite studies here for cyclic fatigue is going to be the University of Texas Arlington, where they took a pipe uh, to 10 million cycles, and it was actually full two times pressure rating. A DR17 pipe rated at 125, took it up to 250 PSI 10 million times. And uh, my favorite part of that is actually after they took it off test with no failures, that the pipe still tested as a brand new pipe, met all of the testing requirements as new. Here's a great example of what HDPE pipe does do when it bursts. Um, being such a flexible material, it actually expands and has a fish mouth or localized burst. Uh, this is going to take very, very high pressures to do, uh, about four times the pressure rating. So that same DR11 rated at 200 PSI, it's going to take uh, 800 PSI to actually burst that pipe. Uh, but when you do have that failure, again, it's a localized failure. You're not needing to, to replace a large portion of pipe. Uh, go ahead, next uh, slide. Uh, so one of the things that I do like to talk about back to the history side and the standard side, um, HCP pipe, we've been doing it the same way for a long time as far as our standards go. Uh, the way we design for surge, the way that we uh, design our pressure classes, we've really had one trick. Like we've done one thing the whole time. Uh, PVC, on the other hand, they've kind of changed things over the years. And so it's just really uh, important to know the history and kind of where the onus goes on designing for fatigue and surge because it's really on the utility. It's on the designer to make sure they're using their PVC correctly. And so in 1986, PVC industry changed their C905 standard. Uh, they increased the pressure ratings overnight. They didn't come up with a new material or anything like that. They just said, hey, these are the bigger pipe sizes. Um, and we really don't see a lot of uh, fatigue. We don't see a lot of uh, cycle spike, spikes, water hammer. So we're going to increase the pressure rating because th th this isn't really a, a failure method uh, for the large diameters being transmission, not distribution. Uh, so that means a DR18 for overnight went from a PC150 to a PC235. Again, no material changes or anything like that. It was just changed pressure classes. Well, in 2007, they changed C900, which back then was for the smaller diameter water distribution pipe sizes. And their reason for doing that was, hey, we haven't had any failures in the large pipe sizes uh, due to this change that we did back in 1986. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna implement that same change on the distribution pipe sizes. And this was a, this was a big deal because they, they added a section on fatigue um, um, uh, design. And they said, it is now up to the utility to properly design these pipes for their systems. And what that came down to is if you have high water velocities or the potential for surges in your water system, you need to greatly reduce your pressure class in a PVC pipe. Uh, this is why it's very, very common to see a DR18 um, running a 100 PSI water system, where in a polyethylene pipe, we hate the same mentality. You know, they'll bring a DR11 in rated at 200 PSI and run a 100 PSI water system with it. That we're, we're looking at it the same way, PVC versus polyethylene, and it shouldn't be the case. PVC and polyethylene, you design them completely different. We actually want you running that polyethylene pipe system at its pressure rating on the pipe, where PVC, they don't. They want you to be greatly derating their pressure classes to make sure that they're uh, safe with fatigue. So it's a completely different way of, of thinking about it. And if you go to the next slide, I'll have a great demonstration on that. Peter. Yeah, we're right there at the end. We have one slide left. So finish her up, Dusty. You're doing a great job. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so this is kind of a, the big argument that we see with a lot of uh, uh, municipalities. They'll come in with a PVC design and they'll say, hey, we need an equivalent DR, uh, sorry, equivalent pressure rating, and we need an equivalent inside diameter. And if you go with both of those requirements, that often requires polyethylene to be upsized to the next diameter. This is absolutely the wrong way to go about it. Uh, you really should be going DR for DR for polyethylene versus PVC. Um, and, and that's for any water system that's over five and a half feet per second. At five and a half feet per second, all PVC DRs are going to be derated to the point that they're identical for pressure class with polyethylene. So that's the correct design criteria. By all means, that's, there's a lot to unpack in that information. So please reach out to us after the presentation if you have more questions, and we can go really into the weeds on design of PVC versus polyethylene. 
we have a flow and hydraulics presentation on our YouTube channel that goes in detail and depth on uh, hydraulic modeling as well. Dusty, as you, you're well aware of, you were part of it. So here, we're definitely not going to deny you of your memes. Um, uh, so go <laughs> well, ahead. This is and, just a uh, funny one. This is one of my more recent, if you will. Um, I, I really had a, a, a podcast that I love listening to. Uh, it's all about weightlifting. I, I love following the strongman competitions. And this particular podcaster talks about, you know, the guys that are just purely bodybuilders, not really doing it strength, but doing it for, you know, for bodybuilding competition. Um, he calls them big for nothings because, you know, they're not actually, you know, competing for weightlifting. They're competing for looks. And so I, I, I considered that the ductile iron guys because the ductile iron guys come out and say, hey, we've got this crazy high tensile strength. It's insane. It's the highest tensile strength out there. And I'm like, well, what's what's the purpose? What do you need all that tensile strength for? You know, polyethylene, we're the the well-balanced gymnast, if you will. You know, we have a 3,500 PSI tensile strength, and it's more than adequate for all water systems across North America. And so they can come out with their, you know, their big, big, big tensile strength numbers, but it, they're big for nothing. You know, they're, they're, it's not really benefiting us in any way. And then the PVC guys, I always like to joke, they're, they're the guys that skip leg day. You know, they've got a higher tensile strength than us, but they really don't have any flexibility. They don't have the ductility that polyethylene has. So polyethylene, we're the, the Olympic gymnast, if you will, perfectly balanced, strong enough for what, what needs to be done. And it was the perfect meme to sum up the day, in my opinion. Well done, Dusty Langston. All right, with that, we want to thank Modern Polymer, Taylor Holiday. Great job. Thank you for sponsoring this program today and, and keeping everybody interested throughout the deck. Great job, Dustin Langston and Alan Ambler, as always. And also to our bench, we handled just about 50 questions today. Great job. And Alan, when is our next webinar? Uh, our next webinar... Um... That'll be at the end of the month. Uh, uh, we're doing large pipe at that time. Uh, we had multiple questions still about how to get a copy of the slideshow presentation. Just indicate that in the post survey, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there, Pete. So lot lots of busy activity from from now until the the uh, big pipe webinar. So definitely hang with the the alliance and catch us at a roadshow. Great. All right. See you on the road. Fill out that survey and you can get your CEUs and PDHs. And with that, we will sign off. See you on the road.